Okay, Ms. Anabusa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Donnelly, can we kind of continue where you were? And I'm very curious, first of all, the statement that you make in your second paragraph in your testimony, where you basically do not concur with Admiral Mullen's views that our deficit and debts are the greatest security challenges that we face. And you said you're worried about our future prosperity depending first and foremost on our future security. So it's kind of an open-ended question, but what exactly are you saying with that statement? I'm saying that the global trading system, uh, which is a source of our economic growth, but also the source of economic growth around the world, rests on a system of safety and security that is essentially provided by the United States. There are others who help, and that the costs of trade and the profits and the economic growth that accrue from trade would be put at risk if the seas, the internet, the skies, all those common areas and the, the politics of, of international politics were more contentious, more uh, riven with conflict, uh, and that we were, our prosperity would, would suffer uh, from uh, international political competition and the prospect of war. I'm also very interested in the fact that your expertise is in China, and I represent Hawaii, and of course China's, the Pacific is very important to me. I happen to believe that when you, when you speak about the stability in the Pacific, I know one view of it is that the United States is providing the stability in the Pacific. The other view is that because the United States is providing a certain amount of stability in the Pacific, it permits China to do its economic growth, which is really in, in being the number one trading partner, and that's something that we're not able to really compete in. So in that light, when you say about the United States' future prosperity, and we are doing this stability, or we're providing something that permits China to now do the economic stability and trade, do you see that at some point we're going to have to change our focus in the Pacific and become more active in one of those areas? Uh, you make a critical point, and I think actually both are true. China's economic rise, its prosperity, would be unimaginable but for the stability and security of the regional trading system that is based on American military power. That's been a great thing for China. It's a great thing for, humanitarian, uh, for humanity. Hundreds of millions of people who were in abject poverty are now prosperous, and it's been a benefit to the United States and indeed to the world. However, the direction of, as uh, Jim and others have pointed out, the direction of China's military modernization it is solely in a direction that would tend to upset or overthrow the security system now in place. And those are two paths, you know, that's a collision course, and uh, I don't think that that's why I would say that uh, the, the direction that China is taking is the most worrisome aspect that I see in the future. Thank you. Mr. O'Hanlon, um, you said something very early in passing, and when you came in, you mentioned something that I'm very curious about. And you said something about 35 to 40 percent more utility on our naval. And I assume what you were getting at was sort of like keeping our or utilizing our forces sort of like a float. That's the way I refer to it. And if I'm mistaken, can you? Please explain what you meant when you said 35 percent more efficiency with the Navy, especially in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. The basic idea here is that I think as you appreciate, especially uh, serving from where you do, whenever we send ships from harbor off to a distant region, we lose the time in transit. But on top of that, we also, the Navy enforces a, a very appropriate policy of no more than six months away from home station for any sailor. Uh, unless it's an extreme circumstance. And when you go through the math on all of that, plus allow the Navy to then shift crews from one, uh, de from one station to another, you know, after a two or three year billet, and then allow for ship repair, you wind up with a situation where the Navy needs about, on average, five ships to maintain one steady forward deployment in an overseas theater. Now, if we, if we uh, home port more in places like Guam or even Hawaii, we'll improve the ratio somewhat. Um, but largely, this is because of the tyranny of distance. Whereas if you leave the ship overseas and you have adequate local maintenance capability in a port, Singapore or someplace else, you can actually leave the ship maybe for 12 to 18 months, and then you can rotate the crew by airplane. That means the crews have to share ships. 
both on the deployed end and on the training end. And it gets complicated. The Navy doesn't like it for that reason, that there are idiosyncrasies to any ship. They'd rather have one crew stay with the ship all the time. Uh, I think there are also, frankly, parochial budgetary reasons why the Navy prefers not to do this. But that's what it boils down to. And if you do the rotation by sea lift, or excuse me, by airplane, you can actually get 35% more capability, more, more days on station for a given number of ships in the fleet. Thank you, Mr. Chair.